thank you so much for coming tonight and for being uh, the first group to be a part of our study abroad orientation. My name is Melanie Holbert, and I am a sociology professor, and I work in academic affairs. And I've been asked to kind of give some opening remarks. And as you can tell by looking at our agenda, we have a lot to accomplish tonight, so I won't take too much of your time. But I wanted to start real quickly just with my own travel experience. And let me just say to you, I grew up in cities. And I didn't grow up traveling. I grew up in a family that spent most of its vacation time going to the typical American vacation sites, camping and Disneyland. And that was great. It was wonderful. But when I met my partner at Western Washington University up in uh, the farthest northwest corner of Washington State, I happened to meet a man characterized by the definition of wanderlust. And the definition of wanderlust is a strong desire for or impulse to wander or travel and explore the world. And within six months of us being married, we moved to New York. And that made him all the more excited to travel because we were that much closer to Europe. And so within six months of us being married, we went on a three-month backpacking trip to Europe. And at that point, my only experience with a backpack was carrying books to school. So I had a backpack that carried everything on my back, and that was a foreign concept to me. Our very first hostel was in an attic with a line of beds and 50 people in one room doing all sorts of strange things that night. But when we woke up in the morning and I looked at my husband, he had dots all over his body. And I said, what is that? And he said, I don't know, but you have it all over your body, too. And sure enough, we had some strange bug bite animal thing in Bruges, Belgium. And thus began, I think, my own de deep desire for travel. Since that time, we've traveled to over 25 countries, and we've invited, well, we've forced, but now invited our two young teenage sons to now travel as well, and, and they've been to over 18 countries, and we're taking them to Southeast Asia this summer, and I'm thrilled for that. You're all here because you have wanderlust in you as well, and you have a deep desire to go outside of your own comfort zone, and you have a deep desire to expand, cliche as it is, to expand your horizons. And some of you have done that already. You've studied abroad, you've traveled abroad, and you actually want to surround yourself with people that are very different than you, and I applaud you for that. Because really, when we think about our experiences here at Western, you're invited to commune and live and study and eat and play with people that are different from you. But that's very different than being in another country. And so I applaud you for being here, because this is an experience that most Americans don't get. And I'm applauding your professors as well, who are brave enough to take you <laughs> and uh, crazy enough to take you as well. So be very gracious and, and thankful for your professors as well. So I'm going to turn it over, and we're going to get started. Tonight's goal is to kind of prepare you with some information that perhaps some of you are quite aware of already, but if not, um, it's to kind of kickstart your really kind of the thinking that needs to happen pre-travel and also during travel and post-travel. We've got experts in the field that are going to help you think about um, what you need to know, even things that maybe you don't even think you, you, you need to know. And so we have a notebook for you to take notes. We have um, an agenda for you. But also there's a study abroad assessment that looks really big, and long, but it's not. It's just a couple pages with really big font. Please don't do that right now, but please have that done before you leave tonight. And hand that to Katie Wheaton, who will be um, taking that from you. As at any university, we love data, and so you are our first group of uh, data entry points. So please make sure you fill that out. So without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Abel Chavez, who is um, an, a blessing on this campus. He's someone that we've invited here because of his 
tremendous passion for travel, his tremendous uh, passion for students, and his knowledge of cultural awareness and cultural mindedness. So, Dr. Abel Chavez. I've done a little bit of traveling. I've, I've visited a couple countries uh, throughout, throughout my lifetime, throughout my career. Um, I'm Mexican-American, <laughs> mom and dad from Juarez, Mexico, just 12 hours south uh, from, 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 let's say, Colorado, Colorado Springs, border town with El Paso. Um, and I was, as I was listening to Melanie, um, I, I was thinking through a uh, uh, last summer when I was traveling from, or I had traveled from Almaty to Amsterdam and I was boarding my plane from Amsterdam, New York City, making my way home to Denver. Anyone know where Almaty is at? Kazakhstan. So I was going from Kazakhstan, f flying back, um, and, and I, I had been in Kazakhstan for a couple of weeks uh, visiting some, some research colleagues there um, on my third trip to Kazakhstan. Central Asia, Asia is an amazing place. And so I was just kind of looking at my passport, right, as an American, right, it's blue like this. And there was a German couple in front of me. Um, and, you know, they were, I mean, they, 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 they had a few stamps and visas in their passport. And they looked to me and they were amazed by the stamps that I had on my passport. And that made me feel really, really good. Um, and so that just kind of confirmed uh, the craziness, uh, I guess, that I do in my work and the, the opportunities that I have to travel. And that's really what I wanted to, to share with you um, today. And if I could get this thing to, there we go. All right, so we're going to be talking about culturally mindfulness or, or cultural mindfulness, awareness, sensitivity, and manners. And you know, if, if we think about this a little bit, it, it really comes down to this, right? So <clears throat> at Western, um, you all are acquiring and building up your IQ, I hope. Um, your, your EQ, as, as you take on different projects and jobs, internships, right? You go through life and, and, and interact with folks. I think you, you build up that social sensibility as well. But tonight, right, at least in, in my next couple of slides, we're going to be talking about cultural kind of intelligence, right, or CQ. Um, and I'll be sharing with you some of the perspectives from my, that I've gained throughout my life and my, and my travels um, and, and what CQ means to me. So <clears throat> what is, you know, cultural mindfulness or, or CQ? And at least, you know, when I think of, of, of CQ, I think that first off, it's understanding the context, right, for why and how we and others think, act, behave in a particular manner. Um, as, as Mexican, Mexican-American, um, <clears throat> I think I think uh, I think a lot of the the, the Latino cultures have have uh, have have uh, have this thing right that, uh, that that we're always running 10 15 minutes late, <laughs> right? And um, and I was in Manila, the Philippines, back in 2010 2011, working on on, on some energy projects, when my my host on the ground calls me, says, hey. Abel, we have a, an, an 11 o'clock meeting. It's, it's 8.30 in the morning. Uh, your driver will be at your hotel to pick you up at 9. Um, but I could, I could see the building from my hotel, <laughs> right? And uh, I said, two hours, really? <laughs> All right. So my driver came, picked me up at 9, sharp. But I realized, though, right, that a lot of these cultures, just because, you know, just, these the cities are so massive, so dense, traffic is insane that it takes, you know, that much, that much more time, right, to get to your destination. And maybe that's why we might be running late sometimes, right? Mexico City is one of those cities. Um, you know, Guadalajara, another big city in Mexico, is one of those cities. Delhi, Mumbai, Tokyo, you name it. Um, but I think when it comes to time as well, right, and understanding those reasons why, I think some of these cultures are very, very kind of connected, right, socially. And, and, and if you're having a meal with friends, with family, you, you kind of appreciate that time, right? And you sit down and you take that little bit of extra time for that extra conversation, right? Um, or, you know, to sip on your wine or your coffee. And, and so I think understanding those things are, are, are important, right? The why or what is, is CQ. 
And also appreciating the views and structures, right, that are in place. Um, there's, um, and, and I'll touch on this a little later, uh, some cultures are, uh, again, the, the, the Latin American cultures, right, um, a, a hug every time that you, that, you, that you greet or that you meet, right, uh, your, your peers, your, your colleagues, is, is appropriate. In the US, maybe a handshake, and it's probably a distant one. Um, <laughs> And, and so I think, I think understanding some of these differences are, 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 and these structures are, are quite important. Um, you know, and kind of recognizing some of these differences in time, in space, relationships, hierarchy, teams, projects, and, and a number of others. You know, again, hugs are, 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 are allowed in, in, in a lot of Latin American countries. Um, in India, on the other hand, where I've done some work as well, not so much, right? So, so appreciating those differences um, and, um, and, and recognizing those differences are important uh, from, from the beginning. Some of these other differences that I've reflected on, you know, go from eating in the Philippines. Uh, you, you eat with, with a spoon, right, in your left and a fork on your, on your right hand. And so you use a spoon, right, to kind of scoop up onto your fork. Um, that's, that's kind of the way you do it. In India, it's okay if you use your, your, your bare hands, right? Or, or, or the bread, right? Or the chapati, right? To, to scoop up your, your food. Um, so eating is, is very different, right? Um, the greetings, hugs versus no hugs versus handshake, um, um, you know, and, and, and the space that you, that you allow for that greeting. Uh, the space, um, here's another, another funny story. One morning, also in Manila, when I was, when I was traveling to, uh, to De La Salle University, Monday morning, it was about 8, 8.30 in the morning, the metro, you could only imagine, right, in a, in a mega city such as Manila. And so I find a little crack onto the, onto the metro, the very next stop, Monday morning, the metro is packed. And so everybody just, you know, that's on the metro embraces themselves at the next stop because everybody is, is literally, literally just rushing or jumping in to get on that metro. And it's, it's, it's hot, it's humid, but you have very little space, right? And that's, that's okay, right, in, in, a, in a place like Manila. In the US, I think, I think we, would, we, would, we would not be uh, so, so, uh, so open to that. Um, business card presentation in China, um, when, I've, uh, when I've gone to China or, or with Chinese colleagues, Right, with your business card, you, 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 you hand it right to your colleague and you are expected to, to comment right, what, once you receive right, that business card. Whatever it is, oh, you studied at so-and-so. Oh, your office is located on such street, right? <laughs> um, but but that's, that's a sign, that's a gesture of respect, right? And, and so simple things like this go a really long way. Um, titles in Mexico. Um, you're pretty much expected, right, to use either engineer or, or lawyer or, or, or professor um, in, in the title and just a, you know, first name, last name will probably get you in trouble um, in a place like Mexico. Um, and gender as well. Um, my, my PhD advisor um, was Indian, or is, uh, my former PhD advisor is Indian, and and, and I had no physical contact with her, handshake or, or, or hug, until the day that I graduated. And on that day, she's the one who invited me to, uh, to for, you know, that first hug. And that was after four or five years of working together. So, you know, understanding these, the, these very important differences, right, across cultures and appreciating them, again, is very important. Now, the why, right? Why should we have CQ, right? Or cultural mindfulness? Well, I think, you know, safety, um, safety in business interactions, but then also safety as you're, you know, walking around the streets and, and, and recognizing some of these differences um, could, could also go, go a long way. Um, it helps us understand and appreciate these differences that I mentioned earlier um, and, um, and, you know, helps us kind of you know, kind of proceed with humility, with empathy, allowing us to adapt to these number of relationships, partnerships, 
um, interactions that we're going to have while we are on the ground with our intercultural peers, right? Um, it, it helps us navigate these multiple situations and scenarios, right? If we're visiting a university, if we're developing a project, if we are, um, you know, uh, uh, scoping a project or, you know, wh whatever that is, um, I think it, it, it helps us be quite nimble and fluid in, in, these, in these multiple interactions. And, you know, it's also, it also helps us reflect and understand that, you know, these communications, right, vary across verbal and nonverbal, right? So, again, I mean, in, in my culture, it's okay if I'm like this and raising my hands and, you know, kind of in your face and, you know, patting you on your, on, on your back and hugging you. Um, and, and very, very close to you. Um, and, you know, in the U.S., we're, we, we probably kind of tone it down a little, right, and, and speak a little softer maybe and not, not as animated. But my Turkish friends, they're just like Mexicans, though, right, and, 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 and loud and, and waving their hands and, you know, patting you and, you know, hugging you. And, and you know, it's, it's, that, it's that very dynamic and animated uh, uh, verbal conversation. Um, and, and all of that is okay. Nonverbal, it goes back to the, you know, the body languages, reading folks, uh, giving, giving uh, or allowing for that appropriate space, um, and um, you know, a, a, number, a number of things that go with the, with the nonverbal form of, of communications. And understanding these again, right, helps us navigate these, uh, these quite tricky uh, situations while being on the ground um, in, in, a, in, in, a, in a place abroad. So, I, you know, I've, I also wanted to share with y'all some of the places that I've been so fortunate to, to visit. Um, it, it, it's a bit of a bummer um, that there are still a bunch of red dots missing on that map, at least, at least from, from my travels. But, um, you know, uh, raised in the U.S. Um, and Mexico, uh, been throughout Europe multiple times, a lot of countries. I know I missed a few of them there. Kazakhstan, India, uh, to a, uh, a number of places throughout India, uh, China, and Hong Kong, Philippines, um, Malaysia, Singapore, South Korea, Japan. Um, but again, as I was putting this together, I was I was a bit depressed though because you know there's 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 much more to to see. Well, or I take it as an opportunity. Um, so you know that's that's kind of how how I've kind of build up my, my own CQ. And my recommendation at the end of the day for you all is travel, right? Go see these places, try these, you know, uh, try, try these different experiences, put yourself in, in these experiences. And I think in some ways it reminds me of the 1939 classic, right? Where Dorothy lands, right, in Munchkinland and says, Toto, I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore, right? And once, once you're on the ground, Right? You're going to make mistakes, but embrace those mistakes, right? So you might, you might not, 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 not give your peers that appropriate space that that culture demands, right? Or you might forget to, to refer to someone by title, right, as is, is, is done or expected in that particular culture. But that's okay. Just learn from those mistakes. They will happen, though, guaranteed. Um, and once on the ground, right, then listen a lot, observe, right? Uh, approach the experience with tons of humility, with empathy, right? Form no judgments, right? Be open, right? To learning and to gaining these new experiences, trying new foods. Um, and, and, and last, but absolutely not least, no comparisons, right? You, you're not in the US. And, um, and that place is unique for, for, for a host of reasons, right? And so appreciate those differences. Um, and that goes, that goes for every country that I visited. We're not, a, we're, uh, that, that, I mean, those places are not for the U.S., or they're, they're not the U.S., and, 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 and that's what makes them so beautiful and so unique. So, you know, definitely embrace these, these differences and make, make no comparisons. Um, and, you know, awareness of your surroundings, I think, also uh, helps quite a bit. Um, there's, uh, you know, places like, like Mexico, India, uh, and, and a lot of these large cities. Um, I think just, you know, watching, um, 
you know, your cash, your belongings, right, your, your watch, right, where, where in the U.S., we have the luxuries of having a bunch of these things, right? Um, and, you know, we want a new fossil watch, we go to the store, we pay, I don't know, what, what are they, 100 bucks or whatever, um, and, and, and we get a new watch. But when I was in Delhi, I needed to wash my clothes after one month, right, on the ground. Um, and so I go to the, to the, to the local uh, corner store, and I ask the gentleman, hey, do you have any, any, any soap, right? And the soap in India that they use to wash um, um, their, the, to wash clothes is, is, is rin, R-I-N. And he says, yeah, I, I have rin. How much? He says, he says, well, 10 rupees. I said, oh, of course. Oh, that's cheap. He says, no, for you Americans, that's cheap, right? But for we Indians, I mean, it, it, 10 rupees is a lot. For us, it's about, at, at the time, a couple years ago, it's about 25 cents, right? So just having right, a sense of those differences, what 25 cents means to us versus what 25 cents means to whatever place you're going to be, you know, visiting, I think is also quite important. Um, and, and that also kind of helps you stay safe in, 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 a, lot of, uh, in a lot of situations. Um, so key takeaways, I believe we're, we're, we're going to share these slides with, with you all, but, uh, but I kind of lay out the main points that I've covered um, around cultural mindfulness or CQ. And um, I also wanted to take a couple minutes to share with you uh, just, uh, just a couple photos, fun photos from, from my various travels. Kazakhstan, this is, uh, this is my host, Merhat. He's the chair of, the, of, of one of the departments right there in Pavlodar at the Pavlodar State University. And this is my name in Russian, <laughs> right? So Abel Chavez and then PhD, right? Uh, I'm not sure what this means, but this is Western State Colorado University <laughs> down here, right? <laughs> Um, so, um, any Russian readers, speakers? Yeah, so I just wanted to confirm that that's what it said, but what's that? Assistant professor, maybe? Uh, PhD assistant professor, Western State Colorado University. Yeah, so, um, so that, that's, that's, that's one place where I have, uh, you know, really good collaborators and, and very near and dear friends. Um, and. Every, everywhere that I go, that I travel, I love just to take, you know, my weekend, Saturday and or Sunday to walk, right, by foot and, and, and see a lot of, 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 that, of that area, of that place. And so this is in Shanghai a couple years ago, a local fish market on a Sunday afternoon. Um, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a very, very fun, fun city and a lot of really good local food. Um, and so this here, this is, this is very fun. Again, same day, just, just down the street from the Bund um, in Shanghai. And um, I, was, I was on this side of the street, and, and you know, there were, there were a bunch of people just kind of gathering, and there were loud and a lot of commotion. Um, and so I just, I, I thought I'd, I'd hang out to see what was going on. And all of a sudden, this white van pulls up, and people become even more excited. The driver hops off, opens the back door, and people start 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 yelling and 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 and, and pointing. And so, what the driver had in this van was a carcass, right, of a cow. And so, fresh meat, right? Sunday, people preparing for their week, and and they were at the meat market, right, just selecting their 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 cuts of meat. Um, again, I mean, it doesn't get any, any more local or fresh than that, I don't think. <laughs> Uh, but you know that's a fun one, and then uh, a couple previous, a couple years previous to that, to that trip um, in China, I was. This is in Agra, India, where the Taj is is located, and that's a bike shop in in Agra. Um, very different, right, than what our bike shops look like here in the U.S. Um, really cool place, and also in Agra, um, this is uh, this is their 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 freight transport. Um, this is how, you know, furniture and, you know, rice, flour, and a few other things um, are transported throughout, throughout the city. Um, and so, again, just kind of, you know, processing and reflecting on some of the differences on how, you know, other folks in different parts of the world either repair their bikes, select their fresh meats, or transport their, their products. Thank you much, guys. Appreciate it.
So next up we have Jess Fogan and uh, Chris Lukengay who are going to come and talk a little bit about how does what happens here at Western translate overseas. So Jess and I, are, are they put us in the middle purposely because we're kind of the bummer part of this, you know, just a little bit. So, But uh, yeah, we're going to talk just a bit. And the bottom line, we're going to talk about policies and conduct uh, overseas, that sort of thing. Um, bottom line is this. Whatever the policies are here on campus are the policies wherever you are at studying. Okay? I mean, that's... That's the bottom line. So we talk about um, uh, just, just some important things. Uh, the biggest deal, right, is going to be alcohol and, and maybe uh, marijuana, OK? And so we're not so naive to think <laughs> that if you're under 21 and you're in a foreign country where the drinking age is younger than 21, that you might not have a sip, okay? We're not that naive, all right? I get that. Just need to tell you, right, the policy is the same, okay? All right, you do, do with that the way you want to do with that. that those are the rules. Um, if, if you get, you know, inebriated or something happens because of that, then when you get back here, then we have to take you through the conduct process, okay? And none of us want to do that, obviously. So, if you're overseas, you're traveling, you're going to maybe try some of the local uh, beverages. Um, just do it very, very responsibly and uh, don't get in trouble. And, and then I have to say this for faculty and staff sponsors that are in charge over there, the, the rules here are the same as the rules there, okay? So, um, and, and uh, you're, you're kind of in charge, and um, any questions? <laughs> <laughs> All right, good. So Jess is going to talk about, and, and I think the other thing, too, we want you to know that just because you're thousands of miles away overseas, we are still here for you. All right, and so if something does happen, some sort of trouble, some sort of uh, situation that you get yourselves into, um, please, please, please make sure you contact your uh, faculty or staff advisor that's with you, and they will contact us immediately, and we can begin working from this side for resources and support and those kinds of things uh, as well. So just going to talk a little bit about uh, some other things to be really aware of. I made Chris do the policy part because I'm always telling people what not to do, so I asked him to do it tonight. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about Title IX. I know that you guys know a lot about this, and we talk a lot about Western, but just to review, especially since you're going to be abroad, um, basically what we want you to know is that all of the same policies, again, do apply, and we are here to support you. So we do encourage that if something does happen while you're abroad, if you are being harassed or assaulted or, God forbid, you do... Um, become the victim of a crime while you were there, we strongly encourage that you uh, report that. And that may be through your study abroad company. If you're going through an independent company, it could be to the faculty that you are traveling with. Um, and then once you do that, we are going to enact all of the same supports that we would if you were right here on Western's campus. We're going to let you know what your options are. We're going to probably even work even harder to find out what we can do for you while you're abroad. What are your resources? What are your support systems? What can we do for you from our campus to help you succeed and to help keep you safe? So we want you to be aware. Um, all of this stuff, again, we're going to send out this PowerPoint, but these are great resources for you. Um, some of the websites and online might be easier to contact versus phones, depending on where you're going to be abroad. So please take these down and be aware. Um, you know, sexual assault and harassment overseas is not something that never happens. And so we just want you to be aware of your surroundings and aware of how we can help you. Um, for faculty, just a reminder that you are continue to be a responsible employee when you are abroad. So if any sort of assault, harassment is brought to your attention, it's really important that you go through all the same steps that you normally would. We need you to contact 
Chris Lukinge is the Title IX Administrator as soon as possible and let us start with that process of reaching out to the student resource provision and deciding what we need to do best to keep you safe. So if you do need a review on what that means to be a responsible employee, I would encourage you to contact myself or Chris Lukinge before you leave on your trip so that we can go through that with you. Um, and also what qualifies as um, something we should report. So if you have questions about that, I would encourage you to reach out as well. Um, just wanted to review a few things about consent. Uh, this is something that, you know, I don't have a lot of experience abroad. Um, I lived in Europe when I was young for about five years, but I was very young. And I don't know what some of the cultural differences are when it comes to living in other countries and consent and discussion about sex or sexual behavior. Um, but again, we expect you guys to abide by, and we hope too that these would be where your boundaries are. So if somebody crosses these boundaries for you, we would encourage you to reach out and ask how to handle it or if you're feeling violated, if you're feeling unsafe. Um, remember that um, consent needs to be informed. You need to be conscious and aware and, and um, aware of what's going on. It needs to be knowing and it needs to be voluntary. It can't be coerced, it can't be forced. Um, you can't perform or do something out of fear for what's gonna happen to you if you do not do that. Um, so please be aware, and there's a lot of different points here. Consent is active, not passive. Um, it can be withdrawn at any time. Just please be aware of your rights and what you are entitled to while you're away in another country, um, especially because it can be very romanticized. You're away, you're in another country, you're experiencing new things and new people and new foods, um, but you still need to abide by these things. And we want you to know that these things are still here to protect you. And then, um, obviously some of you are gonna be going with people you know. So you're gonna be traveling with other students here at Western. But some of you are going to go meet a whole new group of people because you're traveling with a third party group um, and you don't know who you're going to be surrounded with. And so I would encourage you in everything you do, not just on your study abroad trip, but to be a good bystander. And what that means is if you see something that doesn't feel right and doesn't look right and doesn't seem right, it probably isn't right, right? If it walks like a chicken and it sounds like a chicken, it's probably a chicken. So make sure that you're stepping up and you're being that active bystander. Um, the way we do that is a couple things. First, you have to notice that something's wrong, right? You have, to, you have to take the time to look at something and say that doesn't seem right, which when we're sightseeing, when we're busy, even I know in my daily life, sometimes I don't take the time to just notice things. And so taking the time to just notice things that are happening. Interpret it as a problem. Don't write it off as, oh, that's normal behavior. Oh, somebody else will take care of that. Oh, that's not an issue. Or, oh, I don't have time for that. Um, we need to accept that sometimes we do have to take responsibility for things, even though, you know, it might not be our, our responsibility, but sometimes it becomes our problem and we have to step in and take care of it. Um, three ways that we can step up here. There's a few. First, you can be really direct. <laughs> a lot of people are really good at this. I don't tend to be so great at the direct approach, but you can walk straight up to somebody and can say, you know, whatever you're doing isn't okay. Um, that's a really great way to approach a situation, to approach a problem. You can also distract somebody, offer another solution, get them out of the situation, tell them they have stuff in their teeth and make them self-conscious about it, right? Do whatever you need to do to keep them safe um, at that situation. Some people are much more comfortable with distracting somebody out of a situation than they are with being direct. And then you can delegate it. You can tell somebody around you, a bartender, a cop, another friend, the faculty advisor that you're traveling with or somebody within your study abroad group. Don't be afraid to reach out and let people know if you're concerned. Um, be aware of different cultural norms. And this is where I think what Abel was talking about is so important because you might not recognize it as a problem, right? If you're not aware of what cultural norms are or what's acceptable within the culture that you're traveling to. So it's really important to start to learn as soon as you step foot on that culture. You know, what is normal behavior? What is acceptable, right? Um, maybe you're not comfortable with what normal behavior is in the country that you're traveling to. And that's okay. And how do you set boundaries, right? Those sorts of things. Um, and then I put the little caveat, bystander intervention, I think when people think about it, right, you're all probably thinking about some pretty serious situation right now. It can be anything, right? It can be picking up the piece of trash on the floor that everybody else walked by and it's still sitting on the floor and just pick it up and put it in the trash. It's being the person that decides to make a difference and decides to step in and I would encourage you, um, that's what we instill at Western, that's what I learned when I was at Western, right, that we go above and beyond and that we're the change makers and the difference makers and so I would encourage you to do that on your travels and um, you know, teach people in other countries what kind of people that we have here at Western. I think that's really an important part of us. Um, and I think that is all we have, so thank you very much. 
So when I went to Australia as a student here at Western, uh, the plane was landing down in Kuala Lumpur, Indonesia. And there was this amazing announcement that came over the speaker from the stewardess that I'll never forget. Because it was all the stuff that we're used to hearing. You know, we will begin our descent. She's all calm. We're going to be begin our descent into Kuala Lumpur. Please fasten your seat belts and uh, be sure to turn off all your electronic devices. And be sure not to have any drugs on you because if you have drugs on you, you'll be shot by a military death squad. <laughs> And that's why I like, am landing into Kuala Lumpur, and I'm thinking to myself, wow, uh, you don't hear that every day. <laughs> this is going to be a little bit of a different experience. So my name is Nathan Cubes. I'm the director of security here at Western. But interestingly, it's not so much my experience as a security director here at Western that would help me talk to you all about this. It's actually my experience on a fast attack submarine when I was in the Navy. Uh, we pulled into probably eight different countries. And every time, uh, there was one important step that I'll talk to you all about here in a sec that was always skipped for me. Is it would, we'd find out, you know, we're going to go to Italy. And I'd, all of a sudden, the ship would surface, and poof, this hatch would open, and wow, it's Italy. And we'd, me and my friends would sort of stumble out all pale and blinking and looking around. And, um, and, and we'd find ourselves in this, like, vast, amazing place, you know? And... Um, I learned some things in that experience that work and that don't work so well. well for one, I just got to tell you all, be aware of what's around you. Um, and don't put yourself in a situation where you can no longer be aware of what's around you. Um, so again, you come stumbling off and you're suddenly in another country. And, and for a lot of you, this will be this way. You'll, you'll, you're just suddenly there. You don't know what to expect. Um, you definitely already know when you step off that plane, I need to be aware of my surroundings at all times. But it's like maybe after the second day or the third day, and now you're kind of comfortable. You've met the, the people in the hostel where you're staying. and You're kind of getting the feel for this whole thing, right? And maybe, maybe now that's where you find out there's that, uh, you know, party on the rooftop that you see in the commercials where, you know, there's going to be house music and all this stuff. And, you know, that's great. And, you know, you might want to participate that it, in that. But what I would say is have somebody with you. Like, don't go out by yourself and just sort of stump. And, and if you do, then just kind of know, like, you're your own designated driver at that point. And wherever you are, well, that's where you're going to be. And, 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 and that can be amazing. You know, there's, there's, I have some amazing stories where that worked out really well. But I have some stories of people where that didn't work out so well, where they're being uh, returned to the, to the United States uh, in a diplomatic bag, you know. Uh, so there, there's ways of doing this correctly when you guys go to another country. Um, one thing that I'd recommend you all do before you ever leave is find out about where you're going. Like, right, now, that really sounds obvious. But like, the thing is, you're not on a submarine. Uh, you're not just going to be told that, you know, hey, in three weeks, you know, you're going to be in this place and you have no way to research that. You know, do you think there's going to be a difference between a study abroad program to France versus North Korea? You know, uh, you want to know what the risks are of where you're going. There's things about every place in the world that you will specifically want to know about that place. So, so I, you know, I, I was originally going to tell you all about, you know, all these bullet points of like, you know, look, look out, be aware of traffic and be aware of uh, what kind of drugs are legal and are not legal and, and what the consequences are. But some of you are going to Antarctica and some of you are going to France. Some of you are going to Egypt. Uh, some of you are going to uh, Australia and, or Canada. Canada is weird, you know. <laughs> you, you need to know. You need to know what what you're getting into before you ever get there. So do do your homework. Do your threat assessment. Um, if you, you know, did, did anybody go to Standing Rock in this room? You don't have to raise your hand. You know, I tell you what. People from Western went to Standing Rock, and if you are prone to to participate in protests and everything, that's really excellent. One thing you need to know is that protests in other countries 
might have a much different set of rules for how they deal with demonstrations. Um, you could wind up somewhere really strange, have very strange accommodations for about the next, for a month or so, if you participate in the wrong demonstration in various countries that you may go to, or worse. You know, so really be mindful of that. Um, another thing, and, and this is probably the most important advice I can give any of you about almost any situation, is I really want you to be mindful of your own instinct. Follow that instinct. If you're in a situation and you're, you know, if you're in Paris and your friends are like, we're going to go to this place, it's like this basement club and it's going to be really happening and, you know, you can hear the bass from here and you're thinking to yourself, I can't explain it, but I just don't want to go. Give yourself that permission and listen to that instinct. Don't think like, well, you know, that's probably just me being naive or fearful. Or We have these ways, right, of writing off our own instinct and our own ways of reading a situation. G give yourself that permission. Follow your instinct, you know. Um, and, and that goes back to the inebriation part. Make sure that you have instinct. Make sure you have not removed your ability <laughs> to have instinct about a situation. Um, if you see or witness or are, uh, have crimes happen to you while you're there, report that. you got to tell people that. Um, report it to, to the authorities. Report it to the person who's leading your group. But we definitely want you to report that. Don't just say, well, I mean, shoot, I'm, I'm in this country. I, I don't know what to do. Uh, and, and, and plus, it's probably going to be really weird. Uh, you know, I don't want to deal with you know, whatever the police are here. No, report that. We need to know those things. We need to know if these trips are safe, for one thing. We need to know, we, we want you to report whatever you see that's out of the ordinary. The same rules here, you know. Uh, if you see something, say something. So be sure to report something if, if anything comes up. Um, the, I think the last thing that I'll say is just bear in mind, you are an ambassador. You're an ambassador for yourselves. You're an ambassador for the school. You're an ambassador for our country. Um, you might be, people might try to draw you into arguments to be like, yeah, your your politics. And you might say, oh, yeah, my politics. And I, you know, it, it's your decision how you engage. But however you decide to engage, be intentional about how you engage. Because you are definitely going to inform a whole lot of people's opinion about our country, our school, your state, your family, everything that you care about is essentially kind of on the line with how you behave when you're overseas. Um, and the last thing that I just want to tell you all, and this is, uh, should go without saying, but I'm going to say it because I think it's important. Don't bring drugs anywhere. <laughs> I'm serious. Like, like seriously, I, I, we're in Colorado, and I know that Colorado is a certain, but here's the thing. You don't need to be in Indonesia landing, figuring out like, you know, wow, military death squad? Is that what they said? Like, uh, really, you need to be intentional about your trip. And, and this is not the time to be deciding if it's worth the risk to, to bring those edibles on board or whatever. So, um, so yeah, I'm going to turn it over to Erica and Katie. They're going to talk about academic policies. All right, you guys. Most of you guys know me. I'm Katie Wheaton. I'm the study abroad advisor here on this campus. Um, a lot of you guys I've been meeting with for a year or more. Some of you guys I've just been meeting with for a couple months. And some of you guys going on faculty-led trips, maybe I've never met with you. So if I'm going over this to repeat this information, Bear with me, I think it's really important in every semester we do have students that run into these problems. Even at, no matter how many times I go over this, we still run into issues. So let's just um, make sure we're following these policies. So by the end of this semester, you guys have to have a 2.5 GPA to be able to depart, okay? So let's say you guys bomb this semester, you could potentially not be able to go um, on your summer program or your fall program, okay? You also have to have disciplinary clearance. So I know there's only two weeks of school left. Do not get in trouble, okay? Because you may not be able to go. 
Um, you have to be a full student prior to your departure. And for those of you guys that are going for the semester, you have to be full-time enrolled while you're gone. So all of you guys that are going for the fall, let's say you guys have a course you really don't like and you want to drop it, that could drastically affect your financial aid. If you're using financial aid, so you're expected to be a full-time student while you're gone in the fall, okay? Um, you also all need to complete transfer pre-approval forms through the Office of the Registrar. Now, some of you guys going on faculty-led programs, you know what credit you're receiving. Maybe you're receiving your BUAD, what, 397 if you're going with Chelsea to Costa Rica. But how that applies to your overall degree plan, it's just going to come in as an elective if you don't do a transfer pre-approval. If you want that to go towards your marketing emphasis or to knock off a business communication class or if you even just want it to be an upper division credit, you have to get those classes pre-approved. Now, don't freak out if you change your schedule once you get abroad. That's okay. Or those of you that are studying language and you don't know which course you're going to take until you do your placement test, that's okay. We can do a course substitution once you get home. But you really need to be aware of how these credits are going to apply to your overall pro program of study here at Western. Um, all of you guys remember letter grades do transfer back and apply to your overall GPA. I find a lot of times uh, study abroad students are very high achieving students, which is great, who come home with an F because they were having a little too good a time over there, okay? That will be on your permanent record and apply to your overall GPA. So really be conscientious of that, okay? Um, your program needs to be paid in full before you leave the country. Do not get on an airplane with still having outstanding bills for your program. You need to familiarize yourself with your financial aid and refund policies. We'll talk a little bit more about money here in a minute. Um, but be in the know of how your financial aid works. And make sure you're doing everything on your end to receive your financial aid. And know when you're going to receive your financial aid. Um, while, for all of you that are going on a fall semester abroad, you will be registering for the following spring while you're abroad through your My Western account. So I will be sending you email reminders like, hey, remember about us? You still have to register for classes. You need to email your advisor, get your reg code, and register through your My Western account at your day and time, which could be 2 o'clock in the morning. Um, but you still will need to register for the following semester while you're abroad. And just remember, overall, you are a full-time Western student while you're gone, for those of you that are going in the fall, okay? You don't pay any money to Western at all, but you are built in as a full-time Western student while you're gone. So just keep that in mind. Did you have any policy to add to that? Does anybody have any questions about policy? And I'll be here afterwards, too, if anybody wants to come up to me individually and ask me. Um, just be aware of those policies, okay? Now, I mean, just kind of keep in mind, for those of you guys that are on the instructor-led <laughs> faculty trips, that things are a little bit different in the summer. Like, most of you are just registered in three credits for those courses through extended studies. So you may not qualify for financial aid. Um, so there are a few differences, but the majority of the things we want to really emphasize is that you are Western students. You have to be registered for credits. You have to do the work, um, and you have to pay for your trips in full while you're gone there. And um, I think the idea about the transfer is a really great idea to see how those will transfer back. You are going to just come in as general electives or something else. So I recommend speaking with your faculty and with the registrars about that as well. OK, great. So I don't want to overwhelm you guys with all this information I'm going to go through really quickly. This is why you guys all have notebooks. And remember, we are going to email this all out to you. And lots of the stuff we've been going over for over a year, but these are all things that you guys need to think about, you need to consider, and you need to research before you leave the country, okay? Culture, you need to know the language, the religion, the social customs, the cuisine, the music and arts, the etiquette, what cultural holidays, right? If you're going to Germany this fall semester, you wanna know when Oktoberfest is, <laughs> and you wanna plan on it, right? If you're going to go to Spain in the spring semester, it's La Semana Santa, the Holy Week. You want to be a part of that. So incorporate that, even if you're not going to Germany, but you're just going to be in Europe in the fall. You know, you want to think about what cultural holidays are happening and make that part of your experience. Um, you guys all need to research the climate and geography of where you're going. 
This might seem like a no-brainer, but if you're going to New Zealand, that is in the Southern Hemisphere, right? So the, the climate is going to be completely opposite in the Southern Hemisphere as it's going to be here. So you need to be prepared for that. And that's appropriate dress and luggage. You guys do not take a brand new pair of shoes to study abroad in, okay? That's gonna kill your feet. You guys are gonna be walking and hiking and everywhere. Make sure you have comfortable shoes. If you're going to Thailand, or somewhere very rugged, you do not want to take this giant rolling suitcase with you, okay? Nobody's going to be carrying your bags for you. And if you're on a long tail boat in Thailand and they drop you off on an island and you have to jump in the ocean to get to your destination, whoa, you need a backpack, okay, right? You, you can't take a rolling suitcase with you. So just be aware of what you're taking with you. And you guys are always, you always take too much stuff. <laughs> always. So whatever you plan on taking, look at it and then get rid of half of it. Because I guarantee you guys, when you get there, you're gonna wanna wear what they're wearing and you're gonna wanna buy some new clothes, you know? You're gonna wanna participate in that culture and feel. So don't take too much stuff. Um, really think about your gear and really think about local transportation. How am I gonna get around once I get there? Am I gonna take trains? Am I, is, is there access to, to buses? How, how am I going to get around? Some of you guys may be getting picked up at the airport. It's, for those of you that are traveling by yourself, some of you may not be. So have you thought about what you're going to do when you arrive? Have you thought about, well, where is the train station? How do I get to Grantham, England? You know, you need to think about these kind of things, okay? Um, know your criminal laws. <laughs> We've all heard the Amanda Knox story, right? Of studying abroad in Italy. Know that the US Constitution is not gonna follow you. So, so again, kind of back to what Nathan was speaking to, don't take drugs with you and just know, your, know the criminal laws in the country you're going to or the countries. What's really important right now, you guys, is to know your emergency action plan. So for all of you guys going on faculty-led programs, I'm sure you're going to go through an emergency plan of if there is a terrorist attack or if there is a natural disaster, where are we all going to meet? What is our point? And you guys really have to do not, if you pay attention to anything at all during your orientations, pay attention to your emergency action plan, okay? And you're, anybody that's going with a third-party company, they will go over that when you arrive as well. But this is definitely a real thing. You know, we're having lots of it, more, more and more terrorist attacks are happening. Not to make us scared, we just need to be smart about it, okay? And I do get email notifications from all of you guys going third-party par companies to, to know that you're safe. If something happens in Europe, you guys are all traveling all over on the weekends. We have to account for every single one of you guys and find out where you all are and know you're all safe and let your parents know. So know your emergency action plan and stay in contact with everybody if something is to happen, okay? Just a, cute, a few websites too. If, if you guys are feeling kind of lazy and you don't want to do a bunch of research, guess what? The State Department has done all the research for you. All you have to do is click on some of these websites and there's even this last one's for students abroad. All you do is put in your destination. It's like, this is what you need to know if you're studying in this country. So it's all laid out for you guys. So there's tons of resources. Just use them, okay? All right, next, let's talk a little bit about health, health and wellness. You guys need to know your water situation wherever you're going. The U.S. Embassy calls it a stomach readjustment. I think that's a nice way to put it. It's not just, you know, third world countries where you're going to experience a stomach readjustment. You're going to experience this anywhere you go because it's different food, different spices, different water. So it is going to happen. I would say you guys just plan on it happening. Okay? So, um... Just be prepared. It's only going to take a couple days to get through, probably. Um, but and you might want to take a few things with you, a few meds for it. But just be prepared and be smart about it. I think what they say, if you can't peel it, don't eat it. What are the sayings? Something, yeah. Like when it comes to fruits, you need to be able to peel it. Like if it's already chopped up, then it can be contaminated. Um, you know, there are certain sayings they have. So just be really conscientious also of the food you're eating and how you're going about doing it. Um, 
everybody, some of you guys had to get physicals to leave the country, so make sure that you're doing your recommended physicals. And some people um, might need immunizations. So if you guys want to go to the CDC, again, all you have to do is type in the country you're going to, and it will give you a list of the recommended immunizations. A lot of times it's more if you're spending a lot of time in a rural area that they recommend those, but just um, be, be aware of that. Also, you can go to the World Health Organization if you want to know the overall health of the area you're going to. For example, if you're going to Puerto Rico, right, right now the Zika virus is rampant. Well, what does that mean and what are the implications to you? Um, what, what, what is the Zika virus? So just looking into things like that and knowing, knowing the current state of where you're going. Make sure you guys order your prescription meds before you leave the country. If you are taking prescription meds, you may not be able to get those abroad. And they have to have different prescriptions, different doctors. It's going to be a total pain for you guys to figure that out abroad. So if any of you guys even have contacts, contact solution, anything like that, you guys need to order it all and have it stocked up and ready to go for your whole time, okay? Can I add a little comment? Please. Uh, my program is down in Central America. And oftentimes, personal doctors will say it takes some malaria medicine. If you're going to do something along those lines, any kind of medicine, take it in advance a couple of weeks before you leave the country. Because if you have an allergy to it or it's not effective, if you're having some reaction, you need to have time to get off of it and get something else in its place. Great point. You don't want to do that once you're there. Thanks, David. <laughs> All right. And then lastly, you guys, know your medical health insurance policy. So know what, what it covers you. Not here in the States, know how you're covered abroad, but then also if you're going through a third party or faculty led program, there might be an additional layer of insurance in your program. Just know about what your insurance policy covers and, and take a look at that. So if you do get in a situation, the last thing you want to be worrying about is, am I covered? You know, you want, you want to know that ahead of time, okay? Communication, ways for you guys to communicate. So, everybody needs to know their point person. So you need to know who is your point person back home, who is your point person abroad. Have their contact information and know it. Have it on you at all times, okay? Make copies of your documentation. So there's several ways to do this, you guys. If you guys have a passport and a visa and credit cards and things like that, it's a good idea to take a copy of it. Leave one with your parents. Leave one in your suitcase in your room, and then you'll have your passport on you as well. Because if you guys lose your passport abroad, it's a lot harder to, to reinstate that passport if you have no copy of it. Okay? It'll be much easier if you lose your, if your credit card gets pickpocketed. If you have a copy of it, you know exactly who to call or what, you know, website to go to to cancel that card. So, yes, please. Yeah, get a partner, swap it up. It's really important to have copies of that documentation, okay? And you guys, now there's a cloud. You guys could really save all that stuff to a cloud and you could access it from anywhere in the world at any time where there's internet, right? So I think that would be a good idea too, is to save that information. You can even just take a picture of your passport with your phone and save it to a cloud or something, okay? Leave your family an itinerary. You know, I don't want mom calling me saying, Where, where's little Bobby in the world? You know, especially if your parents or you have family members that are really supporting you and, and maybe paying for you to do this. It's a nice, courteous thing to give them a little itinerary and let them know where you'll be around the world so they don't worry about you. Okay? And it's always really important. They say that you guys do a lot of independent travel when you're studying abroad. You guys need to check. Let your faculty member know where you're going on the weekends or let your third-party company know. It's really important because if, that, if there is a natural disaster and you're two countries away, we need to know where you are, okay? So let people know when you're traveling where you're going and what your plans are and what your itinerary is. Um, you know, sometimes people might want to get an in-country cheap little flip phone with prepaid minutes to communicate, just to text. You're going to go over that probably when you arrive, but wherever there's a Wi-Fi, Chad's going to talk a little bit about this too, wherever there's Wi-Fi, you guys can just use your phones, right? So make sure you download Skype, 
You can FaceTime back home with mom and dad for free. As long as there's Wi-Fi, you've got iTranslate. You can translate, you know, any, any kind of different language that you want to. And there's also WhatsApp is pretty popular right now. You can text for free to home anywhere there's a Wi-Fi signal. So if you guys are in a str area with strong Wi-Fi, you'll be fine. But be prepared for Wi-Fi to be slow most of the places you're going, okay? It's not going to be as fast as it is in a lot of places here. Okay, great. So you guys have lots of ways to communicate. You guys are probably more savvy about it than I am because you guys are on your phones probably all the time. But, <laughs> but you know, just, just be aware that of how you think about how you're going to communicate. Um, download some apps and think about how you're going to charge all your electric devices too. You know, most places in the world aren't going to have the same electric outlets that we have. So you might need to convert. If you're taking your laptop or your nice camera or your cell phone, think about how you're going to charge those things, okay, and if you need a converter. All right, next let's talk about money real quickly here. Payment due dates and deadlines. Know your program's payment due dates and deadlines. And like I said before, I mean, a good rule of thumb, make sure your program is paid in full before you leave the country. There are no payment plans for study abroad, unfortunately. So make sure that you guys have this paid in full. The last thing, is that, that's one of the really stressful parts about studying abroad is getting the funds together to do it. So if you guys could just get it all behind you, that, then all the money you know you're traveling with is just pure spending cash. It's going to take a lot of stress off of you, okay? So have it all paid for in full. Um, Erica can talk a little bit about faculty-led programs, but your guys' payment deadlines are right around the corner. So just be aware of that, okay? Know the currency of your destination and the conversion. Do all of you guys in here know what currency you're using? You guys know? And know the conversion rate, okay? And know how, how are you going to get that money? Are you guys going to take out pesos in the ATM? Or, or what are you guys going to do? How are you going to get that money? You know, back in the day we used traveler's checks. <laughs> and I know that's not happening anymore. So think about how you're going to access money when you're over there. But you guys got to think, if you're hopping around Europe, you're going to go from the euro to the pound to, you know, every time you exchange that, you're losing money. So you need to be really careful about how you're going to get your money and make sure you're not losing a bunch of money everywhere. You don't want to get too much money here, but you want to have enough. So, and be aware of international transaction fees. Almost every debit card, you guys, is not only going to charge you that ATM fee, but they also charge you an international transaction fee. That's why I have a credit card that has no international transaction fees. And when I'm abroad, I like to use that because I know I'm not getting charged extra. A lot of you guys may not know that about your cards and your banks, so find that out, okay? And definitely let your bank know where you're traveling. Because now, because of all the fraud out there, a lot of times they like to, if they see your card being used all over Europe, they think that somebody's stolen your credit card. So make sure you're letting your banks know where you're traveling so that you don't get your card canceled or, um, you know, not, not be able to use your card when you need it. Um, when it comes to financial aid, you guys really need to know the policies, requirements, procedures, disbursement date of your loans and your grants and your scholarships. Last year, I had a student freaking out, getting ready to leave the country. I well, I haven't got my financial aid yet. She's crying to the financial aid office. You know, she's solely dependent on it for her experience, when really all she needed to do was something in her checklist in her My Western account. We were waiting on her to do her end of the financial aid, okay? So I know money's stressful, just be in the know of how your aid works. Talk to your financial aid counselors. You guys don't need an appointment. They're in the ground floor of Taylor Hall. You can go see them at any time. Be fully in the know of how your financial aid's gonna work, okay? Um, again, make copies of your credit cards. And I think that's everything. Does anybody have any questions about money right now? Awesome. And I think that's all I have. Great. Awesome. I'll be here afterwards if you guys have any questions, okay? Thank you.
Hi, so I'm Erica Boucher and I'm the Director of Extended Studies and my office helps administer and logistically work or plan all the faculty-led um, international trips. So we're really excited about the four groups of trip, trips that we have going out this summer. Um, and just a couple of things that I want to remind you of is that before you leave, we need to make sure, and every, we should have this from everybody, is that you've turned in your completed application and waiver, and that includes signing off on any medical information that we need to know about you that we can share with your faculty for while you're on, on your course. Um, and we'll get all that, we have all that information. And then we also need copies of all of your guys' passports, because in extended studies, we here at Western keep a copy of your passport in case you do get in trouble, that you have that resource for us as well, or we have that resource for you as well. The other thing that we need is a copy of your flight itinerary. So a lot of you guys are making your own travel plans and you just have a plan to meet up with your instructor once you get in country. We wanna have copies of your travel plans and we keep those as well. And we often share those with your faculty. So in case you don't show up at the airport, this happened last summer, we know at least where you are supposed to be <laughs> and help track you down. So that's really important. And we need that information before you depart for this um, summer semester coming up. My office is in Taylor Hall 303 and Amy Anderson, who I think a lot of you have started to get to know as you've been coming into the office, is our office support coordinator and she's the one that's handling the collection of all of these documents for us. So please, whenever you have that information, just stop by our office at any time. Drop off a copy of your passport, your flight, and we'll keep records of that as well. And then also full payment, we've emphasized that a lot. For me, I'm in the process now of buying a lot of things for you guys. <laughs> and part of the deal that we're making with you is that you're paying for it, and so we're buying these things on your behalf. So payment in full is really, really important for me in our programs. So I know some of you guys are working on some financial aid pieces, or you might need a few extra days, the best thing that you can do right now is to contact Amy and I and let us know that in our office so we can document that and stay on track with what's happening with your payment pieces. Um, any questions on that? Okay. And then just kind of for safe travel as well, just want to remind you, Katie mentioned this as well, that there is the Safe Traveler Enrollment Program, and we really encourage everybody to sign up for that. It's at the State Department site, and you can just sign up for that quickly. And then also just to let you know is that Extended Studies, one thing we did last year, and it worked out pretty well, is we set up a group Facebook for each of the individual trips that go out of our office. So it's a good way that if something was to happen um, that we need to communicate with about France or with Ecuador, we can post that information to that Facebook page, and then you guys can all have access to see that. And then it's also a nice time that a lot of folks, especially those that were more in urban areas last year, they posted pictures of your trip to that Facebook page. Your parents were able to see it if you, if you wanted them to. And um, it was a nice way for us to keep in contact with you and also for you guys to be sharing your experience with us. So once we get each one of those program, those course Facebook pages set up, we're going to be sending that out to um, you guys in the, as in the programs and to your instructors, and we encourage you to sign up and really to join that group because it's a nice way where we can communicate with all of you guys at once. The other thing I just wanted to mention is the insurance. One of the things that, as Katie mentioned, is through extended studies, we do purchase an additional level of health and travel insurance for you. And I just placed that order today, which was, that's a big deal for me, because that's like, you're in. <laughs> and um, it takes about 48 hours for them to process that. So I would say early next week, we'll, we'll be getting your insurance cards back into our office. And we're going to be emailing you to come and pick those up. And so please, before you once again leave for the summer break, to make sure you come to our office and pick up the insurance card. We can help laminate them for you if you like, so you can carry them. Um, we'll keep a separate copy of those in our office as well, but it's really important that you come and grab those before you head out for your trip as well. Um, and then just one last piece of information is that we will have like our, the whole insurance policy posted on our Extended Studies International Courses webpage that's run through our office. And just contact information of my information's on there, your different faculties' information's on there as well. So if you or your parents needed to get to hold of someone here at Western, that information would be available for you guys on the web there as well. So anything else? Any questions? I'm really excited for you guys. Traveling internationally is 
It's an experience, you know, hopefully you could do more than once in a lifetime, but it is a fabulous experience that you'll really remember for a long time, so. So like Erica said, you guys, uh, we're getting here towards the end, so bear with us here, but you guys are going to be, your life is going to change from this experience. You know, I can remember when I went, um, I studied abroad, um, first with the faculty-led program to Costa Rica in the summer, and you know, then you just become this travel junkie is what's going to happen, okay? <laughs> There's going to be so many places and so little time. And I can't describe to you what's going to happen because I just want you guys to just experience it for yourself. But I got back to campus and I was like, I need to go study abroad again. And the person that helped me choose my second destination to study abroad, I thought, wow, it, it, again, it changed my life. I thought, that, that lady's cool. That job would be awesome. So it's pretty crazy that I am doing that today because I always thought, wow, that'd be a cool job. So I want you guys to think about... I just want you guys to be to know that your life is going to change and this is going to be something very powerful and and it is there are going to be ups and downs through this but I think the best two people we have two returnees here that I want to just tell you their testimonials Annie Westbury she is going to she's now a full-time staff member here at Western but she's going to talk about her experience and then we also have Chad Adair who's going to talk about his experience so I, I want to get give them the chance to share their experience and I want you guys to think about hopefully this will be you next year coming back telling us telling all the students getting ready to leave the country about how their life is getting ready to change so let's hear about Annie's story thank you Katie I brought note cards so I don't forget anything thing on <laughs> just kidding um, awesome so I'm Annie Westbury I work in student affairs as a program coordinator for student engagement and Katie came up to me a couple weeks ago and kind of proposed to me kind of giving my testimony about my study abroad experience I studied abroad when I was a junior here at Western um, I guess during the fall semester here I went to New Zealand in June, which was like their fall going into winter. So um, I love geeking out about it. I love talking about it. It's such an amazing thing, and I don't get to do it often because you don't want to be that annoying person that comes back from abroad and like, meh, 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 meh. So I'm super excited to talk to you guys because there's nothing like being in a room with a bunch of people that have itchier feet than you do, especially in the Gunnison Valley. So I pondered what I might share with you guys. and. Um, the life lessons that I stumbled upon through going to New Zealand and um, I could talk to you guys about like how I gained so much confidence and independence going to a place where I didn't know anybody at all but I really want to keep it short sweet and simple and go over three little tidbits of advice that I took with me on my experience and that um, have kept, kept, kept me going through the experience and keep on living through my life right now so um, this is New Zealand. Uh, New Zealand, if you scrunch it up, the South Island on top, or the North Island on top, I should say, and the South Island on bottom. If you squeeze it all together, it fits inside Colorado. Um, so it's a pretty small place. On the South Island, there's more, a bigger population of sheep than there is the human population. So it's pretty rural. Um, so it was a great place. I studied Otago, right where that little pinpoint is. And, um, it made me think to the very beginning of my experience when I was at LAX, getting ready to go on a 12-hour plane ride to New Zealand and texting my mom and thinking, getting this crazy anxiety, like stomach worm knots and thinking, oh my God, I am not in the right place at the right time. This is not where I want to be. This is not what I want to do. I messed up. Like, this is, I'm not with the right people. These aren't going to be my people. I, I'm, this isn't, I'm not, I can't go. And then to six months later, coming back right before Christmas and bawling my eyes out when I had to pick, pack up my suitcase of belongings and memories and thinking, oh my gosh, I see the world completely different now. My world has been rocked and I am forever changed by this. And I get to go back to Gunnison, Colorado, which is really awesome. Um, so I just wanna give you guys three tidbits of advice, sweet, short, simple. Um, and you guys may have heard these before. They may be really obvious to you guys if you've been abroad or been elsewhere besides Gunnison, Colorado, but it's really nice to have them reiterated, I think. And if you take them along with you, I think they'll mean a lot especially when you come back. So the first piece of advice I have for you guys is, oh, 
is to write it down. Um, let me get to this card. I might not have written it. <laughs> so, um, so I think writing is a great way of self-reflecting. And self-reflecting, there's no better way to do it than the now. Um, it is a great way to experience yourself in the moment and later in life. If you write down the places of the places you go, the people you meet, everything. And before I get even to like the journaling portion of it, which I think is so important, I want you guys all to get out your blue little books that Katie graciously provided for you and your pen. Open them up. Think about a high school buddy that you had, a crazy aunt that lives in Vegas that you love, a stepbrother that you come in contact every once in a while, someone that has been an influence in your, influencer in your life or that has been in your life that you really treasure and write their name down. Maybe there's more than one. You can write more than one name down. And just write their name down real quick. So a task for you guys is to text them tonight or tomorrow or prior to your travels and ask for their address. How many of you have received a postcard or a letter from overseas or from a different country? Raise your hand. How meaningful is that? It is amazing to receive that. I sent like four postcards when I was abroad and it cost $2 a piece, which is really expensive for me when I was trying to ball on a budget. But um, it is so meaningful and it means so much to them. Let them be a little part of your travel experience. Let them kind of see what you're seeing through your words. Um, it is so awesome to come back after that and kind of talk to them about what you were doing that day and what adventure you went on the next day. Um, they kind of just, and I have friends that have it hung up on their walls still to this day. Just that little postcard. It's a little bit of nothing that means everything. So um, get those addresses, write them down so you're not like trying to struggle to find Wi-Fi to get their address or send, getting the postcard and writing it and then coming back to the States and then sending it. You know, it's, it's meaningful when you, you send it to them when you're there. Um, and then, writing in your journal when you are there. Like I said, there's no time to self-reflect reflect besides the now. So whenever I, whenever I was abroad, I brought this thing. This is my, this was my journal. It's full and has all my memories in it. Um, and I can step back into time in any kind of week or day that I was in New Zealand and experience the nitty gritty details and moments that I lived in um, right then and there. So I want to read just a little portion. And the thing about a journal is everyone's like, oh, I suck at journaling. I can't journal. I'm not even a writer. I just, ugh, ugh. But the thing is, you don't have to be a good writer to be a journaler. Just write down a sentence a day. Sometimes my sentences were like, today sucks. Like, the weather sucks, and I have a ton of homework, and I don't even want to study when I'm abroad, you know? So, um... And then some days, my pen wouldn't come off the paper. I would be in deep, deep thought about what was going on and what I was experiencing. And my eyes were seeing things that I've never seen before. And I was hearing these weird slangy words that I've never heard before. Um, so write things down. Bring a journal with you. It's an amazing experience. And um, I decided I'm going to share with you guys a little piece just to show you guys how much I can open this book up and step into my shoes of when I was abroad. So... This is a very vulnerable moment for me. <laughs> um, sitting on Otago Campus's coffee shop, October 23rd, 2014, 10:21 a.m. It's been a rainy and cold week in Dunedin thus far, and it has me feeling sick and a stuffy nose and ugh. School is hard. The campus seriously looks like Hogwarts. Humbridge Track, a 60-mile kilometer trek through the Fiordland National Park south of Dunedin, is on the list of to-dos for the weekend. We'll see if I make it. Back to the environmental policy class. Ugh. Skip five days from now. Or skip five days from that moment. Home sweet home, October 30th, 2014. Oh, what an adventure that was. I felt like total shit this previous week and was de debating hard whether to go on this trip. I bought some medicine and camp food and decided to go anyway. Upon arrival to the trailhead, we were greeted by a mutt-looking dog with no people or owners in sight. 
We went onward, and the pooch followed us. We named him W, and he accommodated, accompanied us as a companion for the next three days. He peed on every bush, sign, and grass patch for the first hour of the hike. It was cracking me up that he tagged along and slept, hiked, and ate our scraps through the journey. The first day was a long tramp. It had, to, it had lots of bridges, veered over to the coastal beach for a while, and then upwards we went on a beautifully built boardwalk. We collected water from the bridge, which consisted of a steel bucket with a string attached to the handle that you dipped down and over and down the bridge 30 feet into pristine, clean, drinkable water. I then slipped off the boardwalk and hit the ground hard, making, a, making for a good laugh from the rest of the crew. It was all, hit from there, all, all uphill from there. Seriously, it was all uphill from there. Apparently, Kiwis don't believe in traverses. Also, I saw my first full rainbow today, from one end of the earth to the other. To the other. That combined with my soggy PB&J and river stream flowing into the ocean made for one heck of a lunch break. I'm going to buy my plane tickets to Australia next week. I can't believe I only have over a month left on this dinky, magical island. So it's just like little things like that. I can read back, and if I'm having a crappy day, I can go back and think, oh my gosh, I can't believe I got to experience that, and I can't believe I might get to go back there and experience these adventures again. So write it down. The next piece of advice I have for you. That's W, by the way. Um, when in doubt, ask a local. OK, so my point with this is the matter of fact is that locals know best. Um, so for example, <laughs> to bring the Gunnison Valley back into it, sometimes I play a game called sit on Elk Avenue or Main Street during the busiest time of spring break and point out the locals and tourists. It's pretty easy. You can point out the locals if you know the culture. Just like Abel was saying, know what the locals do, know what they say, know what they wear, how they act. You can point a local out by how comfortable they are in front of people, what they're looking at, if they're asking questions, if they're strolling around. It's easy to point out that local and to find, find those fire brands and white water parks of the foreign country that you're going to be in, you have to talk to people. And with our generation, we're so immune to this pocket technology where we can just get on TripAdvisor and be like, yeah, five stars, I'm going there. But your experience is going to be so much more valuable if you go up and say, and no slang, no slang. Slang makes you cool. And, and the most attractive thing you can do is try. So, so if I was in New Zealand, I would say, Kiora, mate, and they, American is going to be written all over you sometimes. <laughs> and, and you can say, Kiora, mate, sweet ass country you got. Um, is there, I, I'm new to the place, like, is there any like cool coffee shop I can go to or place to journal? Um, it'd be really appreciated. And I guarantee you, in general, most people are good. So, so go and ask them. They want to help. People want to be helpful to you. So um, really try and put yourself out there and talk to those locals. It's going to make for friends. It's going to make for new experiences. It's going to make for the cool spots that aren't on TripAdvisor. So when in doubt, ask a local. And the last piece of advice I have for you is... It's not all rainbows and butterflies. Sometimes it's, it, it, sometimes it sucks. And we all know this social media platform that has this beautiful highlight reel. And that's what we're going to see. And I'm so excited to see your guys' highlight reel. But the reality of it is, is some days you are going to be homesick. And you're going to want a meaty hamburger and not going to be able to access one. Or you're going to want to talk to your mom but not be able to get a hold of her or you're gonna have FOMO fear of missing out and it's gonna get you down because you can't go and do that thing so understand that you're gonna have rough days and long nights especially if you're studying while you're abroad and not gonna want to do the things that um, you have to do it's not all rainbows and butterflies so just be aware that um, and most of it is rainbows and butterflies but just be aware that sometimes it's not and Last but not least, um, if you have an actual camera, bring it. That's a tidbit of advice that I wrote down. 
And then someone once, or when I was abroad, I met this lady, well, when I was in Australia, I skipped over to Australia for two weeks, and I met this lady, Norma Jean, who ironically lives in Lake Tahoe, and was this badass, she was like the first girl, woman, to paraglide in, in the California. And, um, and we were talking about traveling and how magical it is and how amazing it is. And she said, she was like, when you experience an adventure with someone, no one can take that away from you. The connection you make is irreplaceable. Anytime you see them, you can look them in the eyes and remember those joyful moments. And that's so true. You're going to make so many memories with the people you're with at these tables right now and the people you're going to meet. And every time you see them, you get to look each other in the eyes and know that you saw those same unreal experiences and, like, and sceneries and landscapes. So it's just it's cool to know that you guys are going to get your world rocked. And I'm so excited to hear about it. And please come up and talk to me about it afterwards. I love hearing about people's travels. So thank you. Um, first, I just want to say everything Annie just said was completely true. I, every, she put words in my mouth. I couldn't express it any better. Um, but my name is Chad Adair. Um, I'm a business and accounting student here, senior, graduating this semester. So, um, but I was fortunate enough to study at Harlexton, um, north of London in the, in the UK, um, and actually I had one of the best times of my life and really changed me um, forever. But I just want to congratulate all you guys for taking a big leap of faith and really, you know, deciding and making this trip out there and, you know, just getting ready to experience wherever you're going, if it's with a professor, you know, or just by yourself, you know, you're just going to have a great time and it's going to change your world. So um, I kind of just want to start off. Have some stuff here. Um, this is me, by the way, from um, Harlexton. It's a 17th century manor um, in the English countryside. You can't really beat it. It's uh, ex extremely beautiful. This on the right is uh, on the spring morning. Um, one of my friends who actually is still there, she's interning at Harlexton uh, the semester after, she sent me this photo. And it was just, I couldn't capture it any better. But uh, that's us right there. But I just kind of wanted to talk about three main things um, from what I brought back to the States from here. But first of all, just being a global citizen, um, it's huge, uh, especially in our world today. You know, it's, we're millennials and, you know, our, we're interconnected more than ever. You know, we can talk to somebody across the side of the world in seconds and, and it's just going to get even uh, faster, you know, through time. So being a global citizen is major. Um, what is global citizenship? If you're curious about that. Um, it is an attitude towards the world that involves seeing yourself as a part of a wider global community and developing an understanding of the needs, desires, and challenges faced by other cultures. Um, global citizenship will change the way you see the world and will open the way uh, for exciting international opportunities throughout your life. Um, and so, for me, I mean, so studying abroad really is an investment in yourself that you're making right now, which is why I want to congratulate, congratulate you guys. Um, you'll just be, um, you'll make more interesting and just be such a global, just so aware of the global surroundings that you're in. Um, it is just so impactful on yourself. Um, and these qualities will just stick for you for your life and just, you just have no way of just fathoming how important they are to you. Um, and then uh, my worldview absolutely changed, you know, coming back. Um, I started to look at things kind of from just an outside perspective. And then, you know, just understanding, you know, the views that they have on us. And for me, you know, I was there in the fall. And so it was, you know, there's a lot of things going on. There's, you know, our presidential election, uh, which was huge and uh, influenced, you know, a lot of their views. And, uh, and we kind of got, you know, hassled a little bit being the Americans in the, the room and you're walking around, you know, traveling Europe. I was able to go to eight different countries other than the UK. Um, and we're loud. They can spot us out in a second. You know, just how we, we, you know, we dress and how we talk. You're walking to a pub and you're the loudest person in there. And they just swarm you. And, and um, you know, that was just very interesting, you know, trying to just see their point of view of the world and, and how they looked, you know, at our stuff going on in our country and also trying to impact their views. Uh, as well, because um, there's the good and the bad, but you know it was it was kind of cool to just you know change their perspective and see what they had against us. So, so this is just kind of some pictures I had. It's hard. There's so many pictures. Annie, when she she loved to write things down. That was fantastic. I wish I kind of write more, wrote more down. For me, I love 
photography and I love pictures. I took like 5,000 pictures. Like this, it was just, I've never uh, had more pictures in my computer ever. Um, and so just, just kind of just, you know, the relationships you build, um, it's huge. And this one up top here on the far right, this was at, you know, downtown London at one of the biggest pub crawls, you know, in Piccadilly Circus. And it was just so fun. It was kind of the first time we all kind of, you know, met everybody that was there. And, and you can spot the two Americans at the bottom. Uh, kind of dabbing away, you can see them right away, um, and it's it's interesting. And now I wish it was a little bigger, but it's just you know mixing cultures and meeting new friends and just really just uh, just you know getting out of that comfort zone is so important and so impactful. Um, you know this one right here, just for me, it's just you know being a business student and you know graduating here and in, in the business world. You know these you know formal dinners and formal stuff and you know these certain things that you learn. And, and for me, I, you know passion for international. Uh, business as well, but just dinners like this we'd have every night. And in England, you know, these traditions that you just find and where you're going, they have a Sunday night pot roast. It's tradition for there um, every night and also tea time. You, you guys know about that and, and stuff. So Sunday night, we'd always have big dinners. Um, it was, you know, in, the, in this huge manor, and you feel like you're in Hogwarts. Um, this long gallery with the sky painted with clouds and cherubs in the sky and everything's gold. Um, but yeah, we just have big dinners like this. And just, we just, you know, connect with people. We'd share wine and um, you know, just a great time every Sunday. So we kind of look forward to that um, as well. So. so then I just want to kind of talk about just thinking big. Um, what Annie said about, this is just a map. So know the locals. It's huge. Find, find them. They're so helpful. We had took a trip to Rome. Literally, picture this map without no writing or any of the highlighter. That's what we had. And we stayed over on the far right where that one was. And literally, I'm trying to walk around, and we were like, where are we going to go next? We had no idea where to go. We're walking down the street. All of a sudden, this guy comes up. He says, you guys need some help. And obviously, he knew we were kind of lost because we were holding the map. For a while. <laughs> down the street. And so we are like, yeah, of course. He had a highlighter in his back pocket. He pulls out a highlighter. And Lily just draws these paths. And he's like, this is what you do one day, and this is what you do the second day. And so we split it up. And then he wrote, I was like, okay, that's awesome. Thank you. I was like, where's, you know, where's the good food? Where's the pubs? Where's, you know, where's the clubs and stuff? He's like, here you go. Boom, boom, boom. Write them all down where you need to go. So literally, it's just everywhere, you know, I can't even tell you every, every big city it was, just the locals know where to go. And, and literally, just saved us so much time. And, and we, I followed this exact same trail uh, one day and the next after. So that was just a kind of neat story for me. Um, but uh, in regards to just thinking big, um, what I kind of took back from that is, um, for many people, just the, the decision you guys have made to study abroad, um, it's a big one. You've already, you're already thinking big. You're already extending your reach. Um, it's even, you know, many of you have never really looked like uh, in your own neighborhood or, or spent time, you know, um, other places. And um, it's just such a huge leap of faith for you to take, and it's so cool. And um, studying abroad just means taking or breaking all the shackles you have and experiencing challenges that you can never have imagined. Um, that's the beauty of it. Once you've like, decided to jump in, which you all have, um, you'll feel compelled and see it through. And in doing so, when you meet and overcome so many small and large obstacles uh, through the way, it just develops your personality and your confidence to do anything you ever want. And this really is just you know, important, you know, getting out of college and as well as you know, meeting new people, uh, it goes on. So say yes to everything. Be a yes man. This is the time to be one if you're going to be one. Jack got to see the Pope too. I did. I got blessed by the Pope. So that was the truth. Yeah, no big deal. That, yeah, that, <laughs> that was interesting. We were waiting in line for like a couple hours for that. And then right time in the right place. And they shut off all the doors in the Vatican. And we're like, what's going on? We're like, we're locked in here. We can't leave. And all of a sudden, just down the main aisle, here comes all the high priests, everybody, Pope falling, everything. And we were just... We couldn't believe it. And then he comes to the high altar, and we're in the front row. And oh my gosh, literally, he, just, he comes up right over to me, and everybody's squeezing in on me and just drops a little communion biscuit in my hand. And, and they yell at you because you got to eat it real quick. <laughs> they get mad and stuff. They've like, oh, it's, the Italians are funny. But, but yeah, it was, that was a cool experience. But um, as well. uh, so this, I mean, again, just, you know, taking, thinking big and, and learning from your mistakes because you will make some. And they're, it's kind of fun, honestly. And they're not always bad. Um, I'll never forget this photo on the top right. Uh, it's the Grantham train station at 3.30 in the morning. Sunday night, I missed Sunday roast. I was kind of mad about that. 
Um, we had, I had an 8 a.m. test the next morning. We missed a couple flights, and we missed the train. And I'm sitting, finally got into London, and I, I'm sitting at King's Cross, and we're up with a couple other kids, and like, what are we gonna do? We, got, we have, can't miss this test, you know, we gotta get back, all this stuff. And there's no other train, we missed the last train. So I finally went up to the, uh, one of the guards, and I was like, I, I have to get here, there's no other choice. He's like, well, hop on the mail train. So we hopped on the mail train, it's that white train, and literally, it's, and it's you know, and it, it took us like twice the amount of time to get there, uh, to Grantham, but um, hopped on the mail train, finally got into Grantham at 3.30, and it was all foggy, the only people there, called a cab, took us home, but we made it, and took the test the next day, but that was fun. And then, just kind of, you know, these two are just, this is an English market um, in a small town uh, in Lincolnshire, and it's, Literally just, you know, just be culturally aware and just go out and, and go, just go experience their culture to the fullest. And that's, they do this, you know, every week and that's kind of their ritual, these small little market towns and, and they, love, they love to interact and that's just how they socialize. And there's so many cool little shops and trinkets and stuff, so that's why it was true. Just take, <laughs> bring half of what you think you're going to bring because you're going to buy stuff over here because it's so cool and so cheap and, um, and stuff like that. And then this last photo is... Uh, in Switzerland, um, and the base of Mount Pilatus is just just being just culturally, you know, around music and and food, and there's so many cool things to enjoy because uh, these are those famous. I don't even know the name of them, but these famous horns, and they're just so cool. You can hear them from miles away, uh, coming into the the train station. So, uh, so yeah. So I mean, just kind of this some three takeaways too is um, literally uh, look for free Wi-Fi everywhere. <laughs> it, literally, that's, I didn't even buy a SIM card. A lot of people did, and it was fantastic, you know. Um, I was on a budget, too, and that was one thing I said, I can cut this out, and I can find Wi-Fi. Starbucks are great. They're, they're everywhere in the, you know, if you're in the U.K. or whatever, and that we hopped in there and did that. But some big cities, I know in Spain, Barcelona, and, and other big cities uh, have city Wi-Fi for free, and you can just log in on that. And, and it's kind of nice not being connected to everybody at times. But in, in case of emergency, it is, you know, definitely slipping that SIM card in. You know, if you got to use it, you got to use it. Um, and then um, try different foods. If you want to go to the next one. I had to, oh, no way. Oh, okay. Never mind food. Try different foods. I had some pictures of, like, my four, four different things. You will never take enough pictures of food. Um, it, is, it is so so cool and beautiful and tastes amazing and you just kind of want to enjoy it all and never stop eating but um, you can you can work out when you get back here right um, and then <laughs> last but not least just keep on adventuring and just keep having fun and we just want it to be a great uh, experience for you and everybody at Western just really you know is here to support you so much and uh, we just have such a great faculty here so just ex extremely you know important to have as much fun as you can and come back and tell us your stories. So.